Yeah. yeah. So the the second talk of the day uh, will be given by uh, Dr. Atanu Acharya. Please welcome Atanu Acharya. Uh, Atanu graduated in 2016 from University of Southern California under the mentorship of Anna I. Kryler. Subsequently, he joined as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Yale. Then uh, in 2019, he moved to the School of Physics in Georgia Institute of Technology, where uh, he is currently a postdoctoral fellow. He is working with Professor J.C. Gumbar. Uh, his research interest lies in using QMMM and MD simulations to understand the electron transfer and viral binding processes in complex physiological environment. He is going to share with us about how the local environment influences the chemistry and biochemistry of electron transfer and viral binding. Atanu, you can now take it away. Uh, thank you, Dabdas, for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Sure. Uh, can you see my pointer as well? Yeah, yeah. everything's perfect. Thank you. Uh, okay, good Good evening, good morning, uh, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, so today I'll uh, focus uh, and discuss two problems where I found uh, the surrounding environment uh, exert non-negligible effects in terms of interaction. So one problem I pick uh, from a small molecule perspective. So in that case, I'll talk about naphthol and how the solvent affect the photo excited uh, decay of the photo excited state. The other problem I'll talk about is uh, coronavirus binding to the receptor. And let's go into it. Uh, so yeah, like I said, uh, the first problem I'll deal with uh, the electron transfer from uh, electron transfer between solvent and solute here. And uh, on the second one, uh, I'll talk about the virus binding. So uh, what is naphthol? So naphthol is a photo acid. That means if you photo excite the molecule, uh, it becomes suddenly more acidic than it was in the ground state. And naphthol can be of different isomer. So for example, depending on which position this hydroxyl group is at, uh, that decide which naphthol it is. So this is one position of naphthol in molecule. So this is called one naphthol. And this is two position of naphthol in molecule where the hydroxyl group is at. So you have, uh, this is two naphthol. And also you can have cis and trans isomer. And one of the major thing that distinguish one and two naphthol is one naphthol is more acidic uh, than two naphthol. And even bigger distinction between them is uh, one naphthol, the excited state of one naphthol decay much more quickly than two naphthol. So one naphthol decay much faster than two naphthol. And that has been detected by time correlated single photon counting experiment by uh, our collaborator. Uh, um, Eric Nebering. And so we wanted to explain why uh, the two naphthol so distinct difference in the excited state decay. So the hypothesis was uh, the excited state decay, you can have different processes going from the excited state of naphthol. Uh, so our hypothesis was when you excite this molecule, you have this excited state of the naphthol, and then there is an electron transfer from this naphthol molecule to the solvent. So I, so this uh, in green, you have the charge transfer state, charge separate state. So the positive charge is on the naphthol and the negative charge is on the uh, chloroform molecule there. Uh, yeah, and depending on which configuration you have uh, between the solute and solvent, uh, you some configuration will enhance electron transfer and some will suppress. And we wanted to find out, is there some magic configuration in two naphthol that slows down the electron transfer and therefore slow decay of the excited state. Uh, so to do that, uh, the solvent we chose was uh, CHCl3. Uh, the experiment was done in both the solvent, carbon tetrachloride and CHCl3. We picked uh, CHCl3 because we can use the dipole of CH bond there as a pointer to uh, figure out where the solvent is around the solid. Uh, since carbon tetrachloride does not have any net dipole, we can't use that. So that's why uh, CACL3 is a better probe for scanning the orientation around the solid. Uh, 
Uh, but one thing we have to keep in mind, since this is an excited state electron transfer, we first need to describe the excited state accurately. And there goes the problem. Uh, can TDDFT describe the excited state? So what we uh, started out doing uh, is in the experiment, what you see uh, naphthol as uh, seen in all other acin have two low lying excited state. One is called 1LB state. The other one is called 1LA state. Uh, typically in halocarbon solvent, this is the ordering that you get. Uh, and so we uh, first benchmark it with sort of the gold standard method, equation of motion coupled plus the singles and doubles. Um, we see a constant shift from the experiment, but uh, those are constant shifts in all the levels of uh, all the levels. So that can be corrected. But it predicts the gap between those states very accurately. But the moment we go to TDDFT or uh, CIS, which is both of them are single excitation-based methods, uh, what we see is a flip of the uh, ordering of excited state. So one LA state goes down and one LB state goes up. And uh, if we, we tried many different functional and none of them reproduce the experimental order. So this is the experimental uh, energy difference between these two states and only couple cluster based method uh, predict the correct ordering of state. Everything in between here are single excitation based method and they all clip the state. So uh, one thing we uh, tried to see, can we tweak this functional such a way, uh, can we tweak the functional to improve the accuracy? Of TDDFT. So one, the obvious thing that we tried was uh, tweaking the height shock exchange in each of these functional. So for example, uh, in B3 leap, so if you follow this line here, if we increase the heart shock exchange, uh, we see the error increase in one LB state. But at the same time, the error decrease in one LA state, so in this black line here. So, uh, only at around 60% hearty fog exchange, uh, you have similar error in both states, but that absolute value of error is quite high. This is on, is on electron volt, so that's quite high error. So if you are uh, only interested in one LB state, you are probably fine with around 20% hearty fog exchange, uh, but if you are interested in one L, uh, B state uh, and one LA state, you probably need uh, one LB uh, state is much more accurate with lower heart rate exchange, and one LB state is much more accurate with uh, high uh, amount of heart rate exchange in the function. And the reason behind that, there is a mixing between these two states, and uh, I discussed that in great details in this paper. But with with that information uh, that you need a uh, couple cluster based method to describe the excited state, we move on to describe the dynamics. Uh, so to do that, uh, so let's assign this ring. So I call this ring as R1 and this ring as R2. And these are uh, some of the carbon number in here. And uh, what we find is the minimum energy configuration, relative configuration uh, between solute and solvent in the one n uh, one naphthol case is when the solvent, uh, the CH dipole is pointing to either of the ring, middle of the ring actually. And the same scenario is obtained in two naphthol as well. So in ground state configuration, they are all thermally accessible. In terms of energy, this is 2 kcal per mole, so they are all thermally accessible. But the difference occur in the, uh, in the charge transfer state. So after the electron transfer happen, uh, the CH dipole, they move on to the top of the carbon atom instead of the ring. Uh, so, for example, in uh, in in one naphthol case, it moves to this carbon two or carbon four after the electron transfer. But in two naphthol case, there is only one configuration that uh, is stable enough. Uh, so that is when the CH dipole is pointing on top of this carbon right here. And in terms of energy, so those are the few configuration there. So these are within two kcal per mole around here. So those are the few configuration uh, that are accessible. But in charge transfer state, there is a distinct difference between those two. So with those configuration, let's calculate the kinetics. Uh, so we, I calculate the kinetics using Marcus theory. Uh, so where you calculate three different parameters, so the, you have this free energy of electron transfer, reorganization energy of electron transfer. Then you also calculate the coupling between electronic state, uh, 
before and after the electron transfer. Um, and once you have the free energy of electron transfer and reorganization energy of electron transfer, you can also express this uh, activation energy like this. So you don't have to look at all the values. So if you follow this line here, so this is the activation energy column. As you can see, among all the configurations, the activation energy is quite similar between all, all the relative orientations. The main difference occur in two naphthol here. So as you can see, there is one specific configuration where the electronic coupling is much slower than all other cases. So actually it's one order of magnitude slower um, from all other cases. And that configuration can be seen here. So where in the ground state, the CH is pointing in the middle of this ring two, and after the charge transfer is pointing to a C1 carbon right here. So that so those configurations are thermally accessible. So those are the configuration that is giving rise to low coupling, and therefore they will have slow rate of electron transfer as seen from experiment and predicted by computation. And that's why you probably see much slower decay into naphthol than one naphthol. So to conclude this part of the talk, uh, the TDDFT cannot capture relative ordering of excited state of polyacin molecule and naphthol photoacids. And also from the kinetic side of things, two naphthol have few configuration that have very low And those protein you have all over your body from brain, liver, kidneys, lungs, heart, pancreas, intestine, everywhere. And the main role of S2 is uh, help in membrane trafficking of neutral amino acid with the help of another active transporter called b 0 at one transporter. In terms of structure, this is what it looks like. Uh, S2 uh, appear as a dimer and each of uh, each monomer has one uh, helix embedded in the membrane plus membrane. And more importantly, each monomer can bind to one receptor binding domain from the spike protein. From the virus's perspective, uh, you have this viral membrane here, and this is the spike protein protruding from the viral membrane. And in EOLO, you have the receptor binding domain that uh, binds to the uh, S2 like this. But uh, so one of the main thing uh, that I'm gonna focus on today is called glycans. And the process uh, of addition of a glycan is called glycosylation. And this glycosylation happens post-translationally uh, in endoplasmic reticulum and on Golgi apparatus in the cell. So after the protein is synthesized in ER and Golgi, you, you, uh, some, there are some enzyme that add these glycans on proteins, on lipid, et cetera. So in schematically, let's say you have a lipid membrane like this, and you have some proteins that are embedded in the membrane, and then you can have some glycans attached to on top of them, uh, like this and that. So one of the uh, thing I would like to mention here that in glycobiology, uh, so these shapes and color, they represent one sugar. So basically glycans are a bunch of sugars attached to one another. Uh, so each shape and color represent one specific glycan. So for example, this blue square, that's uh, N-acetyl glucosamine. And this uh, green circle, they are manoles. So each of these proteins, they are uh, called glycoproteins since they have glycans attached to them. And similarly, you can have also lipid molecules that has glycan attached to them. So those are called glycolipids. And one of the things there, this uh, glycosylation is important. Uh, the blood group is defined by which glycan you have on top of your blood cell. Uh, so uh, group A, blood, uh, blood group A have a different glycan on top of their blood cell than blood group B and O. And interestingly, blood group A and blood group B differ by only one sugar. So 
so in an essence in your entire cell surface is coated with sugar uh, just like in donut and again just like in donut you can have different frosting on top of it uh, you can have different flavors of glycan on top of your cell surface so why uh, glycosylation is important in coronavirus let's focus on that so this picture i have already shown uh, usually when we model things we focus on the lipid proteins and we usually forget the uh, the glycan and if you look at this picture you can i mean one thing that would come to mind why can't we already design very efficient antibodies because this whole thing looks the structure is known we can focus on one part and design some antibodies based on that uh, the problem is in reality it looks like this so the surface of the spike protein can be covered heavily with glycan. So not every part of the spike protein is exposed so that it can be targeted with an antibody. Uh, let's now focus on how two viruses are different uh, in terms of glycosylation. So this is the model uh, S2, and this is the receptor binding domain of the coronavirus 2, and this is the receptor binding domain of coronavirus 1. Uh, so S2 glycosylation is similar, same between both. But in coronavirus uh, 1 and 2, you, in coronavirus 1, you have two glycosylation sites. One is 330, the other one is 357. But one of them is lost in coronavirus 2. That is the second one. So in coronavirus 2, you only have one glycosylation site. So that second glycosylation is lost because of this mutation. So uh, it's because of a mutation, not exactly at that site. It is lost because of a mutation at N plus two site. Uh, so while talking about glycosylation, one of the major, major problem in this uh, community is uh, we need to talk, we need to consider many different glycosylations. The reason is uh, glycosylation scheme can vary wildly depending on age, ethnicity, and many other, as I mentioned, blood group and many other environmental factors. And so much so, it, it can be different between which cell you use, uh, which cell line you use to express the protein. Uh, so therefore, it's very important that uh, you use different glycosylation schemes. So for our purposes, um, uh, we use two different uh, glycosylation schemes, and both of them are based on a mass spec study. And both of those mass spec study was done in University of Georgia in different cell lines. So those are uh, these are the two uh, mass spec studies right here. And with that multiple glycosylation scheme, uh, the question that we ask is: Does the S2 glycan behave differently uh, to receptor binding domain? And what is the impact of that missing glycan on receptor binding domain of SARS coronavirus 2, which is causing trouble right now? And in terms of simulation, uh, what we did is a two microsecond simulation in each of the system and then repeated for both glycosylation scheme. And each simulation was repeated here to three independent replicas. And this is, okay, uh, what a two microsecond simulation of glycans look like. Uh, yeah. And in terms of analysis, what we analyze it, how closely different important part of the system uh, contact each other. For example, uh, we calculate number of contacts between S2 RBD residues, S2 glycan and RBD, and also we calculate the interaction energies because not all contacts can be favorable. favorable. Some contacts can be unfavorable as well. So that would reflect in, in if there are some unfavorable contacts that would reflect in interaction energies. So qualitatively speaking, uh, if we, see how what is the uh, area around the virus that can be probed by this glycan so this is scheme one glycosylation scheme one and on the left you have sars cov 2 on the right you have sars cov and so and on the bottom you have scheme 2 the main thing to take away from this slide is this s2 glycan this 322 shown in red here and in blue this N90 glycan in blue, those are the two glycans that make most contact with the receptor binding domain. And one more thing is that it contacts more 
in the case of SARS-CoV-2 than in the case of SARS-CoV. So as you can see in the case of SARS-CoV-2, these two glycans are pushed up, where in the case on the right hand side, they are kind of at the bottom. So uh, they don't reach as far into the RBD domain as they do in the case of SARS-CoV-2. So that was a qualitative picture. What if we quantify it? Uh, so this is the average contact uh, between uh, N90 and N322 glycan with receptor binding domain residues. So what we see is there is a clear uh, domain where it makes the most contact. And more importantly, it makes more contact on sars cov 2 RBD than sars cov 2 So this, that's why you have a lower peak there. Um, and this difference is more, even more highlighted in the case of uh, glycosylation scheme two, where in the case of sars cov 2 you have uh, some contact here, but no contact is made in this region with that glycan. And the reason behind that is that missing glycan right here, which is only present is sars cov So that is the glycan that actually blocks the N322 from coming in closer contact. So therefore, they have less interaction. What about the other glycan, N90? And what you see is it depends on the scheme. So as you can see in scheme one, it makes less contact with sars cov 2 than sars cov 2 around this region. But with scheme two, it makes similar contact. So one thing to take away from this slide is the interaction of the N90 glycan with the receptor binding domain is not robust enough. So if you change the glycan, the interaction, you can remove the interaction. Uh, so those are uh, contacts, but let's talk about interaction energies. As I mentioned, or not all contacts can be favorable. So what is, if we plot the interaction energy here, uh, as you can see in both scheme, uh, this N322 glycan make more contact, more favorable contact with the sars cov two shown in red here, as indicated by the, uh, the peak towards the higher negative value in interaction energy. And what about this N90 glycan? Uh, again, this N90 glycan shows scheme dependence. So in, in scheme one, uh, it makes more favorable contact with sars cov compared to sars cov 2 uh, But with scheme two is kind of similar region uh, at the bottom here, right here. So what are the experimental proof of this? Uh, so like I mentioned, one way to remove a glycan from a site is uh, removing the N plus two uh, residue, um, mutating the N plus two residue, uh, mutating a threonine to something other than serine. So what is that experiment is done. Uh, so, so this is a binding experiment. So the blue is better and orange is worse. So what we see from the experiment is most S2 mutation that abolish this glycosylation, uh, they actually reduce binding. That means uh, if you remove that glycan, there is no direct interaction with the RBD uh, with, with the S2. So therefore you have um, less binding. But what about uh, the N90 case? As from our study, what we see is the direct contribution of N90 glycan towards binding uh, the receptor binding domain is not robust enough. And the other hypothesis about N90 glycan is that it can cover up the surface of the S2 that is that actually binds to receptor binding domain and therefore protects against the infection, the virus binding. So all mutation that removes N90 glycan uh, that actually enhances uh, virus binding. So therefore, uh, as we see from our study, the main role uh, is not binding to the receptor binding domain for N90 glycan. Rather, uh, the main role of N90 glycan is uh, uh, protecting against the binding. So to summarize this part, uh, the post translationally added glycans play a key role, key role in S2 binding to coronavirus receptor binding domain. And the N90 can, makes, uh, can make more contact with sars cov 2 than sars cov And the reason is uh, in the case of sars cov 
uh, that interaction is blocked by this additional glycan that is only present in SARS coronavirus and absent in SARS coronavirus 2. And another factor is that uh, this N90 glycan, uh, the direct interaction of N90 glycan with the SARS coronavirus receptor binding domain depends on which scheme you use. With that, I'd like to thank uh, my advisors, JC Gumbert and uh, Victor Batista, and all my collaborators that worked on, uh, on both these projects. And thank you. Uh, I'd like to answer any question you might have. Yeah. Let's thanks uh, Tanu uh, for a nice uh, talk. Uh, now it's time to take the questions. So if someone has a question, they can either write in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah. Uh, hello. Maybe I can. I'll go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Atunu, uh, nice talk. Uh, nice work. So uh, just to uh, honestly, I don't have any knowledge about the glycosylation process and also this glycan. So first, I would like to know that uh, how prevalent is this uh, glycosylation process? Because for, from a general perspective, as you mentioned, that normally when you simulate proteins, we don't use glycans. So yeah. uh, how common, I mean, how wrong we are when you don't do that. So for that, we need to know that which proteins are uh, more likely uh, to have glycans and how important those are and for what kind of proteins and what kind of uh, interfaces will, will be more uh, glycosylated. So that is the first question. And uh, then the next question will be that uh, are these reversible processes that uh, like, uh, for example, uh, some modifications uh, you can also remove, like for example, phosphorylation. Uh, it's, it can be a reversible process. So, are these uh, mod post-transitional modifications reversible? And then, in that case, uh, whether in, in these cases there is some kind of a time scale associated with the reversibility, so it, it can detach or something like that. So, the the answer to the first question is uh, most of the pro I mean, the proteins that are usually embedded in the in the membrane they are most likely to have glycosylation on top of them. And roughly about 50% of the proteins that we deal with have some, some sort of glycosylation attached to them. And the second part of so that just, question- Just a follow up. So uh, is there any kind of uh, systematic uh, study? So here, when you are looking at protein-protein interaction, the binding of two proteins, probably it will have more impact. Uh, but mm -hmm. in, on the overall structure and dynamics of the protein, let's say the, the normal, uh, you have a transmembrane protein, so let's say you're looking at an ion channel. So, and when you're uh, glycosylating at the inter surface or outside, how much that affects the, the basic function of the protein? Is, is there any uh, kind of comparative study of that? Uh, yes, one uh, very nice review by uh, Robert Woods. Uh, so it, in some cases, so it depends on the system actually. In some cases, they may uh, be more, more important than the others. But, so where they are not important, you might uh, get away with not including them. So there is a nice uh, review by Robert Woods. I, uh, let me just put it up. I think uh, I have the citation here. So this is the review um, by Robert Woods. So he uh, reviews the entire field where they are important and how to model them. Uh, in my opinion, that's a very nice review uh, mm -hmm. if you are interested in glycosylation. Sure. And the second second part of your question is, uh, uh, so the way the glycosylation works is uh, each, you have multiple enzymes. So each enzyme is used for adding one glycosylation. And in some cases you need the enzyme to remove the glycosylation as well, because the, the bond is very high, uh, high in energy. So you need enzymatic help to remove those bonds. Uh, so initially, let's say you have mainly mannose. So some enzyme add multiple mannose. Let's say you have M five mannose attached together. Then some other enzyme will come in, remove that mannose and replace it with something else. That's why you have different colors representation. So if I uh, like, right. like this, mm -hmm. so, so in this case, you can entirely have mannose and then other enzyme can come in and remove each one of them and you can have a different scheme. So and it's all enzymatic process, both the yes. glycosylation and maybe deglycosylation, both are enzymatic. Exactly. Okay. exactly. 
exactly so i mean uh, one one probably very important example that we all should know about is basically this i think your so, screen is yeah. oh sorry somehow it got disconnected uh, let me share it again sorry so this example right here so this is the glycosylation scheme you have if you have blood group o uh, so there is some enzyme uh, that uh, the blood group a people have that attaches this glycan on top of that so blood group a has like a tetrasaccharide kind of structure but uh, the blood group b also have a different sugar attached to them that is also a tetrasaccharide and if you look very closely they are only different in one position right here so this um, n acetyl group and where in blood group b we have a hydroxyl group and that's the only difference between a and b and these are done by a specific enzyme mm -hmm. and your uh, immune system is sensitive enough to detect that difference right and so the last question is just a follow up of this that when you showed that there is a difference between the sars cov and sars cov 2 that there was one site glycosylated for sars cov maybe i missed that part so why uh, is that residue not present uh, in the sars cov 2 or there is some uh, structural differences because of which the enzyme cannot approach so, so what the, the reason of the, the difference can you repeat yeah the the, the when the enzyme attaches the glycan it looks for this three residue sequence mm -hmm. and and the third residue must be a threonine or serine and the middle residue can be anything but proline and uh, so you have that NSA sequence in SARS-CoV-2, but in SARS-CoV, uh, you have this NST. So this threonine is mutated to alanine. So enzyme, the enzyme that attaches that glycan cannot detect this NSA. I see. Rather, it can detect NST. So even without touching that specific uh, residue, you can remove that glycan. I see. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, again, I'm just asking. So. Uh, if there was, let's say, some enzyme mutated, I mean, enzyme that could attach there and that could glycosylate that amino acid, uh, then probably it will not, I mean, that will work, work as a kind of a therapeutic strategy. Can I say that? Yeah, that could. Yeah, that could. So we, we need one enzyme uh, that will glycosylate and that can bind to that uh, surface. Is that right? Uh, yes. So then you can restore the glycosylation. Right. right. Okay. So, thank you. That's all. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, Sumita, Susmita, uh, the has a question. So you can go on. Hello, Atanu. Uh, Hi. Just give me a second. Uh, so uh, I I was just wondering about that uh, uh, when you were talk, talking about that this general information that uh, N plus any ith residue, if it is getting glycosylated, then I plus 2th uh, would be mutated. Is it general throughout the whole ectodomen? Is, has it been seen throughout the variants? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that question? Hello. You're talking about hair, right? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay. All right. Uh, so, could you repeat that question? I, I could not hear the part. I mean, this this uh, the glycosylation that uh, site that you have pointed out as a general information that uh, probably if IH site is being glycosylated, glycosylated, then I plus then two. The second residue is getting mutated. Is is that what I understood correct? Uh, no, so, so this is the experiment they did. Somehow they could not uh, mutate the IH site, but they could mutate the I plus two H site for uh, studying the binding effects. So that's that's the data I saw here. And, so this uh, and is means does this uh, experiment show that it is changing some uh, KD? Yes, bind. It is changing KD, yeah. So this is so better. This is it's this higher is in this lower paper. Uh, so if the blue is uh, better binding and the I orange see. is okay. worse. You have a right. you have a marker here. I see. Yeah, sorry. Okay. 
all right but is it, 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 it's this experiment does this experiment show uh, that uh, is it only for particular domain or is it a general information throughout the ecto domain uh, the experiment they did was with the receptor binding domain so only rbd they have done yeah only receptor binding domain i see and which was uh, at least more relevant for the modeling that i was doing i was also working with the rpds now okay thank you and by the way sorry i have another question that uh, yeah. when you have uh, seen means uh, you have done uh, quite a long microsecond simulation and then when uh, you are analyzing all of them uh, in most cases are you seeing that uh, they are intact means in your simulation the movie that you have uh, we have observed that mostly it is staying there or have you oh. seen any decoupling Oh, they are they are covalently connected to protein oh they are covalently connected right yes right. that's yes. true yeah all right thank you and then uh, asa chaudhuri has a, a question um, the question is how did you model glycosylated rbd or hs2 can you hear me uh, yes uh, okay s2 okay so uh, let me go back to this slide here. So, uh, so we followed the mass spec experiment. So in mass spec experiment, what they do is they, uh, for each site, uh, they gave a probability plot for multiple different glycosylation. And we pick the glycan that has the highest probability, uh, highest population rather. Uh, so we pick that glycan from each site from Two different study, and we use that glycan and model attaches it to that particular site. And these two papers have that uh, mass spec experiment on that. Is it, was that the question, or are you talking more about the, the force field? Like, Asa, you can uh, you can speak whether. The question is actually answered or not. I think. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Thank you for your questions. Uh, any any other question? If if no one has question, I actually have a question. Maybe it's a naive a naive question. So that is on the on the first part of your talk. Uh, when you chose, uh, like, if, if you don't mind, can you go to the slide number five? When you, yeah, yeah when you choose your DFT functional, so like on the right hand side, uh, I think plot, it shows that the only the last one, like EOM, uh, is the one which actually reproduces the experimental energy, right? The other, yeah. all the functionals are actually doing very bad. So, like, uh, do you know the reason behind this? Because B3. Uh, LYP is, is kind of like most of the time that is considered as a good uh, functional, right? But here it is totally uh, doing uh, bad job. So. Well, uh, that is, cons I mean, that is considered most times, but uh, I would not say most uh, okay. best functional. Uh, so the, the CCST is not DFT here. And I actually go into more details in the paper uh, about why the difference happen between, uh, that happens because there is a mixing between one LA and one LB state. In, and the mixing, the extent of mixing is different in uh, two, okay. different, na two different naphthol. And uh, if you actually plot the, uh, if you actually calculate the electron hole separation from density matrix, you'll see the, uh, the amount of uh, ionic character in each of these state are different depending on which isomer you are dealing with. Okay. And I you, you can also, also calculate the uh, Pearson correlation coefficient for that as well. So how okay. electron and holes are uh, correlated or anti-correlated. Or not correlated at all. Uh, so that is also very different between which naphthol isomer you have. Okay, I see. Uh, so, uh, like, there is another follow up on that. So, if there is a mixing between the two states, then uh, in the error calculation, I think, like, dep depending on percentage, uh, 
Uh, if you go to that slide, I, I don't exactly, the slide number five. Yeah. Yeah. There is an error, uh, HF exchange. Based on percentage HF exchange, you will have different error, right? So if there is a mixing between the two states, then you'll have to, again, like depending on functional, you'll have to choose different percentage, right? Like you'll have to yeah, choose yeah. optimum percentage for that. Yeah, so uh, th this was just to benchmark uh, so the system, like how it's behaving for this functional and what, which approach should we use before we actually go into uh, explaining the experiment. Uh, so this was a exploration study what works and what does not work and why does not it work. Uh, so yeah, this, this example here is on b 3 So we do the Hartree-Fogg exchange in b 3 starting from 20% up to all the way up to 80%. Thank you. I think Asa has already like oh. uh, explained the, the question. Uh, actually, oh, it would be interesting, yeah. you know, how did you set the parameters by using which software and force play? Okay, so uh, so one so after we get the uh, glycan from our uh, from the mass spec study, so we know the parameters for each individual uh, sugars, and uh, and also we know the connect the parameters for the connection. So that uh, then the stitching them together is with a script, uh, homegrown script. So that is uh, a little tricky and putting all those glycans in a particular position. And in some cases you might have to do a manu manual changing because to avoid some collisions, uh, because you can't really avoid those collisions all the time. So yeah, the answer is mostly with a homegrown script and then some manual modification. And then trusting NAMD to do its job. Yeah, with this, if there is no more question, uh, I think uh, Rajiv Dha has something to say before it ends. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so you can thank the speaker. Okay, fine, Devdas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Devdas, for uh, chairing the session. And I also thank uh, Atri and Atunu for this wonderful talk. And I look forward to this kind of uh, more sessions with uh, another set of uh, speakers in future. So thanks uh, for organizing. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for listening yeah. till so late in Saturday evening. Yeah. Yeah. No issues. So we are doing. So now almost uh, this is the I think uh, tenth session in this series. So two more to go, then we'll complete a year. So okay. So the next uh, uh, SMCB seminar will be on eighth uh, January. Actually, the first. Uh, Saturday of January is 1st January. I don't think that will be a good idea to have a webinar on that day. So <laughs> we would not get any participants maybe on that day. Okay, so we will be, uh, we are just shifting by a week. Uh, so we'll have the next session on 8th January. So we'll post all the details uh, in due course. So see you then. See you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Stay safe.